with us. Welcome to Hannity. President Trump is holding firm tonight. We have new information on that key promise to build the wall in terms of the southern border in bipartisan negotiations with lawmakers today. It was a fascinating and historic on-camera debate. The president put his foot down as it relates to building the wall and securing the border first before anything else is done on immigration. After years of broken promises, not getting the job done from members of Congress, it's about time. Build the wall. Now, meanwhile, obstructionist Democrats, they are showing that they are hypocrites, political opportunists, and total flip-floppers. We have all the tape, all the video evidence you'd ever want. We'll cover that and so much more. We're glad you're with us. Tonight's breaking news, opening monologue next. In what is almost an unprecedented move, President Trump invited lawmakers to the White House today and peeled back the curtains by actually allowing TV cameras into the room to capture their debate on immigration. Now, most of you, I'm sure, were unable to watch this play out in full, so we're going to play large portions for you tonight in case you missed it. Now, the president started off the discussion by telling members of Congress that border security has to come first in any deal. Yes, and we want the wall. Take a look. We're here today to advance bipartisan immigration reform that serves the needs of the American families, workers, and taxpayers. Uh, it's DACA. We've been talking about DACA for a long time. I've been hearing about it for years, long before I decided to go into this particular line of work. And maybe we can uh, do something. We have a lot of good people in this room, a lot of people that have a great spirit for taking care of people we represent, we all represent. For that reason, uh, any legislation on DACA, we feel, at least a strong part of this group feels, has to accomplish three vital goals. And uh, Chairman Goodlatt will be submitting a bill over the next two to three days that will cover many of the things. And obviously, that will, if it gets passed, it'll go to the Senate and they can negotiate and we'll see how it all turns out. But I feel having the Democrats in with us is absolutely vital because this should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. But it also has to be a bill where we're able to secure our border. Drugs are pouring into our country at a record pace. Uh, a lot of people are coming in that we can't have. We've greatly stiffened, as you know, and fewer people are trying to come in, but we have uh, tremendous numbers of people and drugs pouring into our country. So in order to secure it, we need a wall. We need closing enforcement. We have to close enforcement loopholes, uh, give immigration officers, and these are tremendous people, the border security agents, the ICE agents. We have to give them the equipment they need. We have to close loopholes. And uh, this really does include a very strong amount of different things for border security. I think everybody in the room would agree to that. I think that we, it's a question of uh, amounts, but I think everyone agrees we have to have border security. I don't think there'd be anybody that says no. Second, it has to be a bill to end chain migration. Chain migration is bringing in many, many people with one, and often it doesn't work out very well. Those many people are not doing us right. And I think a lot of people in the room, and I'm not sure I can speak for everybody, but a lot of the people in this room want to see chain migration ended. And we have a recent case along the West Side Highway having to do with chain migration, where a man ran over, killed eight people, and many people injured badly, loss of arms, loss of legs. A horrible thing happened. And then you look at the chain and all the people that came in because of him. Terrible situation. And the, the other is to cancel the lottery program. They call it visa lottery. I just call it lottery, where countries come in and they put names in a hopper. They're not giving you their best names. Common sense means they're not giving you their best names. They're giving you people that they don't want. Now, as you watch this tonight, remember, this is the same president that the media and every Democrat has been telling you for days and weeks, and in some cases, months, is absolutely crazy. No, he was very engaged. He was totally in charge and being transparent, extremely patient, 
and common sense solutions were being offered. He was giving you, the American people, a rare glimpse into a historic process on the important issue of immigration reform. And just a few hours ago, while well, the president tweeted, as I made very clear today, our country needs the security of the wall on the southern border, which must be a part of any DACA approval. The president obviously now refusing to back down on building the border wall. I've been saying this for months and years. In order for the GOP to be successful, you guys want to win the midterm elections? Build two or three hundred miles of the border wall. Go down there and cut your commercials. Promise made, promise kept, voters happy. The American people need to see tangible results and progress being made on this key promise is key for November. This has to be fund the wall, build the wall first, because it's always like, oh, you get the tax increase, you never get the spending cuts they promise. You always get the consideration, the amnesty, whatever it happens to be. The wall never gets built. We have been down this road. We've seen this rodeo before. You Republicans, you want to win in November? You're up for election, not Donald Trump. Put the American people, put their security first and show them that by November you're keeping your promises. Just smart, good for the country, good politics. After the president's remarks, Democrats, they quickly moved to their debate. All they care about is amnesty, DACA, amnesty and DACA. Take a look. Democrats are for security at the borders. I want to state that emphatically. There is not a Democrat that is not for having secure <laughs> borders. There are obviously differences, however, Mr. President, on how you affect that. You, you just indicated that yourself. And you indicated this would be a first step, and then we continue uh, to talk, as we're talking today, about how we best secure the border. There are differences of opinion in, within your party and within our party. So I would urge that we move forward on uh, protecting the DACA uh, protected individuals, young, young people, young adults, as you pointed out in one of your statements, who are productive parts of our community, uh, that we protect them and, and get that done. And then, because I think everybody around the table, as you pointed out, is for security, and then the issue is going to be how do we best affect that border security. So I would urge us to move, uh, as, as uh, uh, Senator Durbin has urged us to move, on the DACA students. As a matter of fact, the speaker, I think today, but maybe yesterday, said we need to solve the DACA issue and, and we need to solve it in a way that is permanent, not temporary. And uh, I agree with him on that issue. And interestingly, when you say that uh, President Obama, when he signed the executive order, actually said he doesn't have the right to do this. And so you do have to go through Congress and you do have to make it permanent. Whether he does, whether he doesn't, let's assume he doesn't. You said it. Uh, and that was a temporary stopgap. I don't think we want that. I think we want to have a permanent solution to this. And I think everybody in this room feels that way very strongly. What happened, Mr. President, I think, is that the Senate passed a comprehensive immigration bill, as you know. Right. Right. We did not consider it in the House, so we didn't reach those issues. Uh, very frankly, on border security, Mr. McCall, the chairman of the committee, reported out a unanimous uh, security uh, solution which, which we then included in the bill that we uh, filed on comprehensive immigration reform. So I think we can reach agreement. Well, I also think that after we do DACA, and I really believe we should be able to be successful, uh, I really think we should look in terms of your permanent solution and to the whole situation with immigration. I think a lot of people in this room would agree to that also. But we'll do it in steps. Uh, and most people agree with that, I think, Dick. We'll do it in steps. Even you say, let's do this. And then we go phase two. Kevin, what would you like to say? Well, first, I want to thank you for bringing everybody together. You got the Senate, you got the House, you got both parties. And I like the exchange of ideas. And I think everybody has a point here. The one thing I don't want to have happen here is what I saw in the past. There were former bills that were passed on border security years ago that never got finished. There were immigration bills passed that were right back at the table with the same problem. Let's make a commitment to each one, and most importantly, to the American people, that when we get done and come to an agreement, that we're not back at this problem three, four years from now. That's why, yes, we've got to do DACA, and I agree with you 100%. But if we do not do something with the security, if we do not do something with the chain migration, we are fooling each other that we solved the problem. You know how difficult this issue is. 
So let's collectively, we're here at the table together. I'll be the first one to tell you we're all going to have to give a little. And I'll be the first one willing to. But let's solve the problem. But let's not tell the American public at the end that it's solved when it's not. Great points by Kevin McCarthy. Here are some of the other big moments from today's immigration debate. Take a look at this. The country is doing well in so many ways, but there's such divisiveness, such division. And I really believe we can solve that. I think this system is a very bad system in terms of getting together. And I'm going to leave it up to you, but I really believe you can do something to bring it together. Yeah? Other than going to dinner with Bob, I've been doing this for 10 years. I don't think I've seen a better chance to get it done than I do right now because of you. John's right. I'm not going to support a bill if you don't support it. I've had my head beat out a bunch. I'm still standing. I'm Lindsey Gramnesty, Lindsey Gomez. You name every name you want to give to me, it's been assigned to me. And I'm still standing. The people of South Carolina want a result. How could I get elected? I've been for a pathway to citizenship for 11 million people because I have no animosity toward them. I don't want crooks. I don't want bad hombres. I want to get a merit-based immigration system to make sure we can succeed in the 21st century. I'm willing to be more than fair to the 11 million. I just don't want to do this every 20 years. The change of immigration, though, has taken a very big hit in the last year with what's happening. I mean, you're looking at these killers, whether you like or not. We're looking at these killers, and then you see 18 people came in, 22 people came in, 30 people came in with this one person that just killed a lot of people. I really don't believe there are a lot of Democrats that are going to be supporting chain migration anymore. Should we have the Homeland Security yeah, Secretary? If you, if yes. you don't mind, just, just okay, a couple things on border security. I just want to try to make sure we're all linking. The, the reason that border security is so important to have as part of this discussion is that it doesn't solve the problem if we can apprehend people, but we can't remove them. So we need the wall system, which is some physical infrastructure, as the, the president described, personnel and technology, but we have to close those legal, legal loopholes because the effect of that is this incredible pull up from Central America that just continues to exacerbate the problem. So border security has to be part of this or we will be here again in three, four, five years. Again, maybe unfortunately sooner. I just want to reemphasize what Secretary Nielsen said. Uh, it is so important that you understand when you talk about border security, if you apprehend somebody at the border, but then you cannot send them back outside the United States, even though they're unlawfully present in the United States, uh, you have not solved this problem because they're then released into the interior of the country and the problem persists. And that sends a message back to wherever they've come from. I agree, they Bob. come to it. you know what? We're going to negotiate that out. Absolutely. I agree, and I think a lot of people agree on both sides. The other thing that we've got to look at, the wall itself, Mr. President, if you talk to your Border Patrol chief or the former Border Patrol chiefs, I've asked them, how much time does the wall buy you? They'll say a couple minutes or a few seconds. And this is our own Border Patrol chiefs that have said it's that. It's not mine. But, but mine is not clear. The, the, the wall works. works. Oh, well, the the one one the wall works. They We're say without the wall, we cannot have border security. Okay. Yeah. Let, let, let me show and you. all you have to do is ask Israel. Look yeah. what happened with right. them. No, without the, Henry, without the wall, you can't have All right. Wall Homeland works. appropriations. Uh, your chief was there, and the former chiefs have all said that. Now, the other well, thing is, well, if you look at, this is where the wall is, Mr. President. If you look at where the walls are at right now, this is where the activity is, where the walls are at right now. We have massive miles of area where people are pouring through. Now, one of the good things, because of our rhetoric or because of the perceived, you know, my perceived attitude, fewer people are trying to come through. That's a great thing. And that, therefore, I mean, our numbers have been fantastic, maybe for all the right reasons. But let me just finish my thought. Uh, the the uh, I want to ask you that we're playing, you saw the game last night, it was a good game last yeah, night. Very good game. We're playing defense on the one yard line called the U.S. border. We spend over $18 billion a year on, on the border. If we think about playing defense on the 20 yard line, if you look at what Mexico has done, they stop thousands of people uh, on the southern border with Guatemala. We ought to be looking Henry, at what we're doing. We stopped them. We stopped them. You know why? Mexico told me, the president told me, everybody tells me, not as many people are coming through their southern border because they don't think they can get through our southern border, and therefore they don't come. That's what happened with Mexico. We did Mexico a tremendous favor. We actually put appropriations to help them with the southern 
and the point water. is, I know, we always give everybody, but every finally, other nation gets money but ours. But finally, We're always last, looking for money. But we give the money to other nations. But finally, the last one that we have to stop. is, instead of playing defense on the walking out line, if you look, we, this is your material. We know where the stash houses are at. We know where the hotels were at. We know where they are across the river. And we're going why, after them. Why stop? Why play defense on the one yard and line? We're going the after them like never before. We're going well, all after I'm saying the is, stash if we focus on DACA, we can work on the other things separately on sensible border security. Listen to the folks that are from the border. And, and you folks are going to have to hear one voice. You folks are going to have to come up with a solution. And if you do, I'm going to sign that solution. Yes. We have a lot of smart people in this room, really smart people. We have a lot of people that are good people, big hearts. They want to get it done. I think almost everybody, I, I can think of one or two I don't particularly like, but that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think everybody. Look, Henry, everybody wants a solution. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, everybody wants a solution. You want it, Henry, yes, and I want it. Is there any agreement without the wall? Uh, no, there wouldn't be. The wall has to be. Have to, you need it. John, you need the wall. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I'd love not to build the wall, but you need the wall. And I will tell you this, the ICE officers and the Border Patrol agents, I had them just recently up. They say, if you don't have the wall, you know, in certain areas, obviously, that aren't protected by nature, if you don't have the wall, you cannot have security. Just can't have it. It doesn't work. If you don't have the wall, you'll never have security. Also, the DHS Secretary Nielsen made some great points, as you saw in that exchange. And as we saw today, the president and even some Republicans are saying the border wall has to come first. It has to. And then Congress can talk about other things. To me, that's the right answer. If you build the wall expeditiously and fully fund it, you can move forward. You can have your discussions. Uh, chain migration also must go away. The lottery system we've learned in the last year must go away. And when it comes to the Democrats, they are massive hypocrites, and they're being exposed as nothing but political opportunists on the issue of immigration. I doubt anyone else in the media is about to show you these massive flip-flops. Take a look. I voted uh, uh, numerous times when I was a senator to spend money to build a, uh, a barrier to try to prevent um, illegal immigrants from coming in. Um, and I do think you have to control your borders. Where it was necessary, we did support some fencing. Where it was necessary, we did add border patrol agents. We have done what by any fair estimate would have to conclude is a good job, quote, securing the border. People who enter the United States without our permission are illegal aliens, and illegal aliens should not be treated the same as people who entered the U.S. legally. The American people will never accept immigration reform unless they truly believe that their government is committed to ending future illegal immigration. The president's decision to end DACA was heartless and it was brainless. If this order stands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of families will be ripped apart. Tens of thousands of American businesses will lose hardworking employees. But those who enter our country legally and those who employ them disrespect the rule of law. And because we live in an age where terrorists are challenging our borders, we cannot allow people to pour into the U.S. undetected, undocumented, and unchecked. If there are disruptions in these countries, if there's conflict, if there's bad governance, if there's war, if there's poverty, in this new world that we live in, we can't isolate ourselves. We can't hide behind a wall. It shows how far left now this Democratic Party has moved. By the way, anyone else going to point out the hypocrisy? I guess now that it's politically expedient for the Democratic Party, they're now opposing the policies they were passionately supporting in mass. Now, FoxNews.com has a great article up today showcasing the Democrats' blatant hypocrisy on immigration. Here's the headline. Dems changed tune on border wall after backing barrier oh, under Obama. And the reporting points out that five years ago, under Barack Obama, the entire Democratic caucus voted to build 700 miles of fencing along the southern border. It's the same area that President Trump's proposed border wall would cover.
They didn't get the job done, and it doesn't end there. The bills Democrats supported, which was called the Economic Opportunity and Immigration Modernization Act, also included $40 billion over a decade to strengthen border security measures and also called, the doubling the number, called for doubling the number of border agents to be hired. Would have been a good idea. Here's what this tells us. Democratic Party and their opposition to what President Trump is asking for, it's nothing but a total farce. It's about playing politics, identity politics. It has nothing to do with the facts and reality about what is going on at the border. Look, I have personally been reporting from the border at least a dozen times. Horseback, all-terrain vehicle. Uh, I've been out there on helicopters and boats. I've done it all, all of it. I've seen gang members being arrested, a warehouse, the biggest one you've ever seen, floor-to-ceiling drugs that were confiscated. I've been in a drug smuggling tunnel and much more. The problems down there are real. Human trafficking, drug trafficking. Democrats don't want to address these issues because they'd rather try and now score cheap political points. All right, when we come back, we'll continue our discussion. Kellyanne Conway is here. She'll respond to all of this on a busy news-breaking night on Hannity. Is there any agreement without the wall? Uh, no, there wouldn't be. The wall has to be there. Have to, you need it. John, you need the wall. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I'd love not to build the wall, but you need the wall. And I will tell you this, the ICE officers and the Border Patrol agents, I had them just recently up. They say if you don't have the wall, you know, in certain areas, obviously, that aren't protected by nature, if you don't have the wall, you cannot have security. You just can't have it. It doesn't work. Welcome. <clears throat> Got it. Welcome back to Hannity here with reaction to my opening monologue and the president's big bipartisan meeting on immigration at the White House today. Counsel to the president, Kellyanne Conway, is back. Uh, good to see you, Kellyanne. Here, the president put out this tweet earlier tonight, and he said, building the wall, and we heard him over and over again, it's imperative. I know that conservatives, friends of mine, they doubt because they've been promised again and again and again. We always get the consideration, amnesty, never the wall. We always get the, ta the spending increase, never the tax cut. Now we have the tax cut. People want to see that wall. They want to see some of it by November. Everyone in that room today, everyone watching now, knows where the president stands on the wall. He just repeated it for you live and in person in front of the entire world to see, Sean. Yep. The wall is an imperative. And the wall, the president made clear today, because he's talked and he's conferred with those literally on the front lines who want this wall. We, he asked the ICE agents, he asked the Border Patrol agents, he asked those on the front lines what they need. Secretary Nielsen has asked her, folks, what do you need to be able to do your job to make us a more safe and secure nation? And they've all said, we need this type of secure we need a border you know we have spent billions of dollars over decades helping other countries secure their own borders their own sovereignty it's high time we did it in our country and this is the leader who will make it happen donald trump i think in the span of one hour today you saw in full the three major promises this president has made to the country security prosperity and transparency the transparency is obvious even some of his greatest critics in the media were flabbergasted, really stunned, but appreciative that this president held forth on camera for a full hour with no filter, no script for anybody, just a conversation, bicameral, bipartisan, unprecedented in that way in the cabinet room. Secondly, the security. This president knows his first obligation is to keep us safe and secure in this country. You do that with a wall. The wall, the southern border, 2,000 uh, miles about 800 or so might be the physical wall. There are mountainous and river areas where you can't put a physical structure, but you can put fencing. You can have technology. You can put more agents there. It makes us more safe and secure. People are already not crossing as much as they did illegally because this man is president, because they know walls are being built, because they know that folks are tougher. We don't want the poison, the drugs coming over our border. We don't want people here illegally through chain migration and the visa lottery. And, and finally, the prosperity. Economic security and national security go hand in hand. And you see what's happening in, with this president, his leadership, his bold actions along with that of the Republicans in Congress and that massive tax cut for the middle class. 
they are making this country more prosperous. Consumer confidence, unemployment levels down for African Americans, for teens, for Hispanics, for women, for all of America, all the confidence measures up. National security, economic security go hand in hand. The wall is not negotiable. The Democrats came there today basically saying DACA is not negotiable. Give us a clean DACA bill. The president said no. The wall, DACA to be considered the wall, but also an end to chain migration, which accounts for about 9.3 million uh, resettlement, resettled in the population a year. But you about know, one person uh, I, comes I, here and you get about seven family members. Some said in country send upwards of 20 members. When, I, show, to stop. when I showed the tape of Chuck Schumer, and then there's Bernie Sanders, and then there's Hillary Clinton, and then there's Barack Obama. Yes. You know, all these Democrats, they basically sound like Donald Trump. But now, because Donald Trump supports it, they can't possibly support it. Only if the anointed one, Obama, maybe if Oprah supported it, they support it. Um, and so, is it just opposition to this president for the sake of opposition? And the other point is, all these days, I saw a president in command of the facts, leading, opening up transparency like we never had before today. And that's what made it so fascinating. It was, and those of us who work there see that every day on a regular basis. He, he really enjoys a discussion. He, he welcomes dissent and he welcomes discussion. This president takes many different inputs and ideas and he makes the final decision. He was the one elected here after all. But I think what you saw on full display today is, is very similar to what we see in an ongoing basis at this White House. Uh, and let me, let me just say this, when you ask what's different now, um, sure. What's different for these Democrats, including Hillary Clinton, they are crowing and bragging about how much she doesn't think we should have people crossing illegally and we should have borders. And wow, she should have said that in 2016. She might have made some of those states more competitive, although uh, anyway, we would have won anyway. But the fact is that what's changed is, number one, they have a president who's willing to actually do it. And just like with these tax cuts, just like with you agree? moving the embassy to Jerusalem, people have promised mm -hmm. it, but they never thought they'd have a president who would do it. Number two, they are beholden, many of them, to special interest. And this is a president who's talking about would national it? interest, not special interest. Last question, quick answer. We're running out of time. For 2018, isn't it good for the Republican Party to be able to say, see, we're keeping our promise. We, we have two or 300 miles of the wall done now. Take a look at it. We meant it. We, we got it done. No doubt. We didn't get here overnight. We know the wall can't be built overnight, but people seeing that it is happening, that you have a physical wall, you also have technology, you have fencing in places where a physical wall cannot happen. And most importantly, you end the chain migration, the diversity of right. visa lottery, and you show people Absolutely. about that southern border that we have more ICE agents there. We need to empower these men and women with the tools they need to do their jobs. All right, Kellyanne, thanks for staying up late. I know you're always up early. We appreciate it. When thanks, we come Sean. back, Ed Henry is here with a live report on disturbing new details on the anti Trump dossier. Also, Laura Trump and more. All right, welcome back to Hannity. Congressional panels are investigating whether Trump-hating FBI agent Peter Strzok and, of course, his mistress, Lisa Page, helped leak information to the press. We had our special report last night. Also today, Senator Dianne Feinstein, she released a transcript of Fusion GPS co-founder Glenn Simpson, his August interview with the Senate Judiciary Committee, here with a live report from the White House and all the latest details. Is Ed Henry and Ed, they, they talked about somebody died already over this? Yeah, a question that may be leaking out this information in the so-called Trump dossier, that unverified information about the president, may have led to someone being killed, an intelligence asset who was revealed because of this information that was published. In fact, in the last few moments, the president's personal attorney, Michael Cohn, has filed two lawsuits uh, involving the dossier over defamation, one for, for BuzzFeed, which published some of this, uh, the other uh, being... Uh, uh, actually, Fusion GPS, the company that put together the dossier, and Glenn Simpson personally, the former journalist involved in Fusion GPS. More on that in a minute. As you mentioned, the FBI tonight also facing more scrutiny over anti-Trump text messages on the eve of the 2016 election. Specifically, what lawmakers on the Hill are looking at, back and forth messages between FBI officials Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. These were particularly uh, messages about a Wall Street Journal story apparently focused on the Clinton Foundation, which of course is now the focus of a renewed FBI probe into whether the original review of the foundation
product was too soft. These texts show the duo suggesting they knew in advance about the story and then were going to share it with FBI colleagues and pretend they knew nothing about it, raising questions about whether they leaked sensitive information or whether they and other FBI officials actually leaked classified information, a question that the House Intel Chairman Devin Nunes will get a chance to ask Strzok and Page since we have also learned that those two FBI officials will be among eight witnesses brought before the House Intelligence Panel in the next few weeks to get answers about Fusion GPS and alleged wrongdoing among FBI and Justice Department officials. Another key witness is going to be Obama Justice Department holdover Bruce Orr. He was just stripped of another title at the Justice Department. Remember, his wife actually worked for Fusion GPS and was a so-called Russia expert. That company's co-founder, Glenn Simpson, under the microscope after, yes, you mentioned Dianne Feinstein released his transcript of his private testimony to a Senate committee last summer. She says, Dianne Feinstein, she released the more than 300 pages to set the record straight, but allies of the president say there's no evidence of collusion for the Trump campaign, and this transcript actually raises new questions about Fusion's collusion with the Hillary Clinton campaign. The transcript shows Simpson declined to answer several questions about how Fusion was paid since since then, of course, we've learned from Republicans getting bank records that Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign and the DNC paid for this information through Democratic attorney Mark Elias. Now, when Simpson was pressed on whether Fusion GPS was a Democratic link firmed, he responded that he did not think so, despite that money passing hands. As I mentioned at the top, breaking this hour, though, about this dossier, the personal attorney for the president, Michael Cohen, longtime ally of the president, just filed two suits. In New York State, he's filed a suit against BuzzFeed for f publishing some of the dossier. BuzzFeed has just put out a statement tonight saying that, quote, the interest to the public is obvious in that dossier, and that's why they publish it, and they will aggressively defend their First Amendment rights. And then, meanwhile, that's in state court in New York. A federal lawsuit just filed by Michael Cohn, the personal attorney for the president as well, against Glenn Simpson and Fusion GPS, this firm that put together the dossier with that former British spy, Christopher Seale. So this is just breaking the last few moments, Sean, and it shows that the Trump camp is really fighting back here over all of this, Sean. All right, uh, Ed, great report tonight. We appreciate it. Yep. And joining us now with Reaction, Fox News contributor Sarah Carter, Fox News legal analyst Greg Jarrett is with us. You know, Sarah, this is the Hillary Clinton bought and paid for dossier with paid for Russian lies and propaganda and salacious details that were never true. Um, well, I th go ahead. No, well, I think one of the most interesting points uh, that's been brought up today is that, you know, Glenn Simpson testified that the FBI had a source within the Trump campaign. And uh, by the way, that story, a colleague of mine here uh, pointed out that that story is still a top story on the Washington Post website. What's interesting is that According to people close to Glenn Simpson in Fusion GPS, he misspoke. That isn't true at all. That what he was referring to was Papadopoulos actually yep. in, in London. So here we have, you know, the Washington Post still with the headline out there that there was a source uh, working inside the Trump campaign for the FBI, and it's it's flat out wrong. Yeah. So th there's a lot of there's a lot of factual errors, uh, and and even within his own testimony, uh, and, and there appears every to be news misleading. Network, they went nuts with this and you're right they've been wrong they've been wrong all along let's talk about the legal side of this uh, Greg Jarrett uh, I'm glad Michael Cohen was fighting back truth does matter sure. thoughts oh it absolutely does and it's a legitimate defamation lawsuit a false statement and clearly the dossier is false that damages somebody's name and reputation look I went through all 311 pages of Glenn Simpson's testimony. It's pretty clear this is a guy who trades in rumor, innuendo, suggestion, and wild speculation. I think he's read too many uh, Robert Ludlum and Tom <laughs> Clancy novels. Yeah. I mean, it, basically, the entire 311 pages is trash because this guy doesn't know anything. Uh, the dossier, he's asked as to every specific aspect of the dossier right. did you verify this? Did you verify that? And the answer is no. Amazing. Uh, I love the fact you read everything and, and we love you for it, Greg. You really are amazing. Sure. Let me ask you this. They're talking about already a death in the case. Now, hang on a second. When we reported, Sarah, on, right here on this program, that Hillary Clinton 
And the Fox News Channel reported that five foreign intelligence agencies, 99 percent likelihood that they got all of those 33,000 emails and then some and classified in top secret and special access programs. If James Comey is drafting that, in fact, remember the draft, the exoneration before the investigation. That's right. And Comey wrote himself that it was likely these foreign entities got it. Do we know of any potential harm that came to anybody? Well, certainly. I mean, this is the main reason why we don't want classified information in the hands of enemy states and even our allies. We want to keep that very guarded. Uh, so that could certainly be true. There could certainly be in people or assets or areas that are compromised now because of those uh, potential access to Amazing. her server. And even with the dossier right now, I know that people are looking into this. We don't know. We don't know. Look, there were a lot of bad pairs in Russia, a lot of bad players out there. So people could be uh, killed for many reasons when, when things like this happen. So, But we don't even know what we're hearing here is factual. So we need to do a little bit more investigation. Comey and Strzok rigged the primary so Hillary could keep going. And then, sadly, she rigged the primary against Bernie Sanders. And on top of this, we have uh, this literally Hillary Clinton bought and paid for dossier. We have so much more news coming in the days ahead. Good to see you both. By the way, I kind of like you without a tie, Greg Jarrett. Uh, I know it's <laughs> a casual vacation day for you. We dragged you in. Thank you for coming. And when we come back, President Trump responds to reports that Oprah Winfrey might run against him in 2020. Laura Trump and Joe Concha are here to, with reaction, and you will not believe the Hannity hotline. Yeah, you know, Oprah would be a lot of fun. I know her very well. You know, I did one of her last shows. She had Donald Trump, this is before politics, her last week. And she had Donald Trump and my family. It was very nice. No, I like Oprah. I don't think she's going to run. I don't think she's going to run. I know her very well. The president earlier today responding to a report Oprah Winfrey might be the savior for the Democrats against him in 2020, something the liberal media has been completely giddy about. Here with the reaction, The Hill's Joe Concha and President Trump's daughter-in-law and senior advisor for Trump 2020, Laura Trump, is with us. First of all, congratulations. I just saw pictures of the baby. Thank you. Absolutely. That hair is to die for. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Look, I, don't, I honestly think that when all the noise settles, at the end of the day, the fact that we have two million fewer people on food stamps, the economy is turning around, every indicator. I won't go through the list oh now. Oh my gosh, we could go on for, for hours, right? I have, I have 100 and some accomplishments yeah. in year one. Yeah, well listen, let's not forget that is what the strategy is for 2020. That is what my father-in-law is going to run on. The incredible achievements we've already seen. He hasn't even been in office for a full year. And look at what he's done. So I would love to know if Oprah is who we have to run against in 2020. She's an incredible woman. I think she has many, many accomplishments under her belt, a great television host. But let's not forget, Donald Trump in 2016 defeated 16 incredible GOP candidates and Hillary Clinton, and the, media the darling at the of idea. the media. Oh, they had, that said he had no shot. And it's going to be a lot harder, I think, to run against him in 2020 than anybody is uh, suggesting right now. And I think Oprah would be very smart to sit this one out. Yeah. Well, why is there a desire always of the media, Joe, for their savior? Because we know that they wake up in the morning seeing what, what they can hate Donald Trump about for an, any given day. Sean, I think the media is advocating for an Oprah Winfrey candidacy because never in the history of clicks and ratings. Would there be anything better from an infotainment perspective, from a business perspective, than Winfrey versus Trump in 2020? And I just find it amazing that the same media that derided a political novice and a TV host for having the audacity to run in 2016 yeah, is now drooling giddy. over the prospect of Oprah Winfrey doing it in 2020. Yeah. You know, one of the things I always like to ask you, because I, I watch the attacks on your family. You know that they are they always wanted to get Donald Trump. They never thought he'd win. Then he wins. Then they're attacking it. Then, then Russia collusion, not proven. A lot is now boomeranging back, but it's hard. As, how hard has it been on your family? Um, listen, it's, it's, I won't lie and say it's been easy. It, it's hard every single day. We get hit from every possible angle. No matter what we do, we're going to get hit. So I think for all of us, it's about making sure that we support my father-in-law and 
the incredible job that he's doing for this country. The it's agenda's so good important. for the country. Laura. It is. There's no two ways about it. And come February 1st, when people have a lot fatter paycheck, even the people that didn't vote for Donald Trump are going to say, wait a minute, maybe this guy is on to something. Maybe these, this tax reform was a good thing. How is uh, the baby's four months old, right? Almost four months old this week. Has he been in the Oval Office yet? He has. Yeah. Yes. And you have those pictures? Have you tweeted those out? Oh, my gosh. Out? Yes. We have. Actually, Eric tweeted a picture out of him you there. You know he Oval. has the same desk that John F. Kennedy had and Ronald yeah. Reagan had. And they, have, they still have that opening. I think he may be the youngest to sit behind that desk, Arsene. Oh, is that so, true? Yeah. You, I would take the picture in the opening, too. Yeah. Um, and definitely with the hairstyle I saw today. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, all right. Last word, Joe Concha. It really, I think at the end of the day, the noise goes away. Is the economy better? And do we, are we safer as a country? And how many promises did he keep? Well, that's what you have to look at, Sean, was what was the five biggest issues that voters voted on in 2016, according to most polls. Economy, okay, which you could say things are going excellent, as you pointed out before. Jobs, unemployment at a 17-year low. ISIS, the caliphate, 98% of it destroyed. Healthcare, incomplete. That didn't work out in 2017. Uh, and then, 